Good. How are you? Could the candidates for, um, we're starting with school committee. Margaret Robbins, Aline Davis. Aileen, Aileen, yep. And, um, and I'm Meg. Push Meg, what? Yeah. All right. Be counsel. All right. Call me whatever. Good evening. Hi, thank you for coming. And welcome to the 2023 candidate, uh, candidate forums for Northampton School Committee at Large and City Council at Large. I am Marie Gauthier from Shelburne Falls, Mass, and the League of Women Voters of Franklin County chapter. I'm also currently co-president of the League of Women Voters of Massachusetts. Tonight's forums are co-sponsored by the League of Women Voters of the Northampton area chapter and the Daily Hampshire Gazette with the technical collaboration of Northampton Open Media. As your moderator, I want to welcome the candidates for the offices of Northampton School Committee at large and Northampton City Council at large, and to thank them for their participation in this nonpartisan outreach to the voters in the community. I also want to thank members of the community for your attendance tonight live or virtually, and for submitting questions in advance. None of these questions have been viewed by any of the candidates before this evening's forum. These advanced questions were compiled by staff at the Gazette and members of the League of Women Voters. In addition, League members are offering the live audience tonight index cards and pencils to submit questions starting now and as the forum proceeds. Please raise your hand and pass your question card to the end of the aisle if you have one and include any follow-up questions as the evening proceeds. Uh, the League of Women Voters encourages informed, active participation of citizens in local, state, and national government, but it does not support or oppose candidates or political parties. It has a long tradition of providing voter information services such as these forums. Northampton Open Media, Northampton Community TV, is streaming these forums live tonight via their website, they are also broadcasting them via Comcast Community Channel 12. Recorded versions will be available in their TV archive and on YouTube starting November 3rd, Friday. Our agenda tonight is as follows. The forum for the candidates for Open School Committee at Large positions will be from 7 to 7.45. After a break, the forum for the candidates for the City Council at Large will be from 8 to 9 p.m. Candidates will each have two minutes for an opening statement, 60 seconds to answer a proffered question, and 60 seconds for a closing statement. Our timekeeper team, seated in the middle of the front row, will provide information on time remaining to the candidates using paddles. Do you want to show them? <laughs> I would ask that the candidates not continue their answers after their time has expired, though please finish your sentence. I also, uh, also ask that our live audience hold your applause and remain silent until the end of the forum so that we can cover as many questions as possible. Questions will be asked alternatively by Chad Kane, Managing Editor from the Daily Hampshire, Daily Hampshire Gazette, and Ingrid Flory, and a League of Women Voters member from East Hampton. Each candidate will be asked the same question with a rotation in the order of their responses. So let us begin with opening statements from the candidates according to the order they are listed on the city clerk's website. Uh, right now I'd like to interject that uh, candidate Gwen Agna, who was scheduled to be here tonight, unfortunately was taken ill and could not. So only the two candidates are here tonight, Margaret Robbins, also known as Meg, and Aileen Davis. Uh, first to speak will be uh, Ms. Robbins, and you have two minutes. Thank you. 
Um, I come to you as a parent, as a grandparent, as a teacher, and as a member of our community for the past 50 years. And I'm really happy to be here. And I thank, I'm very grateful to the League of, League of, League Four, women voters <laughs> for inviting us this evening. It's something I think our whole community looks forward to when we do elections throughout our municipality. Um, I spent two years on the school committee as a member from Ward 1. And when I was elected by my Ward 1 constituents, I looked forward to serving them again. But that has changed. So I am now seeking re-election as an at-large candidate, which is a very similar position to being a ward candidate. As ward representatives, we do um, listen to everybody in the city. We make decisions for all the children in our city. We make uh, responsible use of the budget. We talk together. We work out decisions together. Um, there's not an enormous difference, except that we might be responding personally to a larger cohort of people. But it is a little bit more of an assumption of task. The job of the school committee is to ensure that we produce educated citizens who are able to function in a society that requires them to think clearly, to be able to understand what truth is, to be able to read media and know what makes sense and what doesn't make sense, and who actually know how to be activists for change. And that's something that I have done for my entire life. Um, I. I'm very much looking forward to having another two years to follow through on the work that I've done on the school committee for the last two years, which is as chair of the curriculum committee, as a member of rules and policy. I attend all the budget and property meetings, and I am also uh, a member of the ad hoc exit interview committee. And those are ongoing responsibilities that I look very much to, forward to enjoying in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Ms. Davis. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Aileen Davis, and thank you for hosting this forum. I am currently one of two at-large members of the school committee and am seeking re-election. I would like to continue my work as a positive, responsive, and effective voice for Northampton's excellent public schools. As the parent of three Northampton public school graduates, a public school teacher, and longtime Northampton resident, I am also deeply devoted to our public schools. My unique perspective lends itself to work on the school committee. I was born and raised in suburban Maryland, and after college, I served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Honduras with a focus on health education. That was a really long time ago, but the experience informs a great deal of who I am. I worked as a union organizer for the Garment Workers Union and earned a master's in labor studies at Rutgers University, and then worked as a union educator for the Food and Commercial Workers Union. When we moved to Massachusetts, when my husband got a job at UMass in the library, I went back to Smith College for my teaching degree, and I've been an elementary school teacher for 25 years. Our children were lucky to be educated by the smart and creative teachers at Ryan Road, JFK Middle School, and Northampton High School. We are grateful and wish to give back. In the capacity of parent and teacher, I've seen firsthand the negative impact of MCAS on so many children, the importance of art education and equitable funding for the arts, the importance of prioritizing small class size, and the need to refocus budget strategy, among many other things. I would like to be part of a highly effective and collaborative school committee that will work on these issues. It was rewarding to participate in the extensive and successful search for our superintendent, Dr. Bonner, and I look forward to working with her. Thank you. Thank you. The first question is from the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and it will be uh, answered first by Ms. Davis. Thank you, Chad. OK. Is this, is this good? OK. Um, first of all, thanks for, for giving so much of your time over, uh, on the school committee for such high pay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you've already answered. Part of my first question, but, but I, I think it's an important one. Um, do you support or oppose the elimination of the MCAS as a graduation requirement, and why? And why? I uh, definitely support um, the elimination of MCAS for a graduation requirement. Um, I believe that it's such high stakes for, for a student to be told they can't graduate when 
that's one moment in time. So one time assessment is not the whole picture of who that student is. And I believe it would make much, makes much more sense to look at the whole of their performance in school and what they maybe need to improve on in other ways, whether it's a portfolio or just looking at their grades or something like that, but not just one day of a test. Thank you. Ms. Robbins. Thank you. I've been actively, um, uh, I guess you would say, opposing MCAS um, for many, many years, since its inception. I, right here in Northampton, I came to our school committee uh, 20 years ago to say, we have something coming down the pike that is not going to be good for our kids and it's not going to be good for schools. And Northampton's always been a good advocate for saying, whoa, we need to pay attention to what's happening. Where we are now with MCAS, um, after the, all of these years of seeing what the impact is on teaching and learning, teaching to a test, assessing kids, causing anxiety in schools, driving teachers away from the workforce, is it is about Northampton, but it's also about all the children. I have worked across the country and across the state as a school change coach. I've worked in schools where kids are parked in front of computers for three periods doing math prep. Um, this is about children who don't finish school. This is about children who are Latinx, who actually have a high dropout rate, and it's about using data to show us that um, it, it is not good for children in any way possible. Thank you. That, that red sign is really <laughs> big. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the next question is from members of the community and asked by Ingrid Flory, and it will be answered first by Ms. Robbins. So what are two things that you would like to accomplish during your term on school committee? I have a list. I'll pick out two. Um, I spent this morning speaking to a student who's organizing, who I've been working with for a little while, on um, organizing students to create a green curriculum across the state, which is a proposal that's come from our new uh, state climate yeah. officer. And we also, I think, will be working locally with that. And she invited me to a group that's meeting on Thursday at the Springfield uh, Museums, where it will be all youth who are gathering to talk about what their future is going to be and how they organize together in order to educate each other about what needed changes need to happen um, in climate, but also with their schools and how we invest locally in green schools and think about what uh, we need to retrofit to make schools safe and comfortable and um, places where the kids 20 years from now will be able to go comfortably. I only got to one, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ms. Davis. Can I clarify you said two? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't sure which ones <laughs> I should circle either. Um, uh, one of them is a personal goal for myself that I would like to do and achieve, and that is to make more of the community aware of how they can access the school committee. Be, um, there always are people that know how to do the email. They know who to write to. They know how to look at the website. They're comfortable going to schools, and I think that um, we need to make sure that more people know that they can reach us and for me to do better outreach to the wider community. Um, that's a, a, a goal that I would set for myself on the school committee. And indeed, um, it's not a pleasant thing to think about, but a fresh and creative look at our budget that's absolutely looming and um, that's a part of what I would need to be a part of, want to be a part of. Thank you. The next question is again from the Daily Hampshire Gazette, uh, and it will be answered first by Ms. Davis. Okay. I think I'll uh, follow up on the, the budget that you mm -hmm. just left off with. So <clears throat> as you both know, a top priority for, for the next school committee will be balancing next year's school budget without the ARPA money and without the city emergency fund probably um, uh, that was used to balance this year's budget. So. Uh, how would you go about pursuing opportunities for funding uh, besides the local taxation that... So my face. Um, 
one of the things that so many in our community have done, many on the school committee have done, is continuing to um, advocate at the state level. Um, that's not a quick fix, but it, it ha we have to be unrelenting about advocating for Northampton. Um, because we're a city, um, we end up coming lower on the list in priority from other cities. Um, I would say, um, uh, we need to be creative about our budget, really focus on what are, what are our priorities, which of course are the st students. And um, this is such a long question, <laughs> so a long answer of how many things. So I didn't really answer the question fully. Sorry. Thank you. Ms. Robbins. Our budget reflects our priorities, what we spend uh, and how we spend it and what we spend it on in an educational budget is a pretty good reflection of what we really care about as a community. And we are always up against the wall in terms of what we can afford, uh, what comes to us easily. I am bringing three resolutions to the school committee actually this uh, coming Thursday, November 9th that are proposals that are backed by Joe Comerford um, and by other state legislators that have not come to surface yet, but they're really looking at how the state funding works. We are caught in Northampton between being not wealthy and not poor enough to get really what the cap at 82.5% 82 sets for us, and we have to really be active about working with other communities in order to rethink that. Additionally, I would like to see us work much more closely with the city council rather than one large meeting we have other, every year with the uh, school committee, be able to sit down in smaller groups and really work together about where we can find those places that will support each other. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to remind people if they have questions to raise their hand to give their cards to uh, league members who can compile them. Uh, the next question from members of the community uh, is asked by Ingrid Flory, and it will be answered first by Ms. Robbins. All right. So hundreds of Northampton families have chosen to send their children to charter schools and private schools rather than Northampton schools. Why is this happening, and does it concern you? Yeah, it sure does. Um, that's a lot of bucks going out the door every single year, but I totally get why parents make that choice. When we have kids, we want them to have every day be a great day. And there are a lot of reasons why parents might choose a different experience because they have those options. We are surrounded by choice and charter. We get kids who come in on choice. One thing that I have heard from constituents is that we have reduced access to arts. We've reduced access to music. Um, our classes are bigger than we really want them to be, and we don't offer children um, after-school activities or other, other positions that we simply can't fund at this point. So those are large pieces we need to look at, but we also need to think about how we attract people back in terms of creating the neighborhood that means that our kids all grow up together in the same community, going to the same sorts of schools. Thank you. Ms. Davis. Uh, I also have very strong feelings about charter schools, and I um, clearly every family does what is best for their student, for their child, for their loved one. Um, however, I feel very strongly that if people leave, if when things aren't the way they want them to, then that's not how it improves. And so if you want to stay, if you want to uh, improve something, if you don't like it, then figure out how you can be part of fixing it is what I really um, try to live by. And also, it takes money from, um, from regular public schools. And um, uh, I think that we need to promote, one of the things that I was trying to say before was, again, promoting our schools, Northampton schools are where it's at. You can be part of that change. Thank you. The next question is from Chad Kane at the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and it will be answered first by Ms. Davis. All right. Um, what role should a school committee member play in helping a parent with their frustration with their child's teacher? Mm.
The school committee has a very defined role. We, and so, if I, and we get many emails and phone calls, and the role is to guide them to where they need to go to solve their problem. Um, that we are here to support the superintendent who supports the administrators, who supports the teachers who teach the children. And so this, their starting act, action needs to be within their schools and we can help guide them to where all their resources. Thank you. Ms. Robbins. Okay, thanks. Having been a teacher, I'm pretty sensitive to that too. Um, Kids really matter, and when a parent has an issue with a teacher, they want to talk to somebody about it, and that's totally, completely understandable. I think school committee members can listen. We should all be very good listeners. But as Aileen says, there is a legitimate course that um, parents need to take, which is have you talked to the teacher, have you talked to the principal, and then you need to talk to the superintendent. And we are, I think, all very clear about that. We can listen, um, we can offer some subjective information if it's something or objective information that we're quite sure of it could be um, do you have books available for students in children's classrooms and I think we can say yes we do have books available in children's classrooms but ultimately it's that discussion has to start organically with the teacher at this level and then with the principal and the superintendents the oversight for all of that thank you the next question is from members of the community and it's asked by Ingrid Flory and it will be answered first by Ms. Robbins. All right. So the school committee has had many lengthy meetings of five or six hours. Currently there's no live audience for these meetings and no written minutes or written transcript from YouTube available to the community. This makes it difficult for public employee participation and decision making. What do you see as challenges to having more concise or transparent um, meetings? And how would you go about changing what the school committee is doing now? We don't have efficient me meetings. And I think part of it is um, the agenda is set by an agenda setting committee, which is the superintendent, the chair, and the vice chair, and the business manager. We don't see the agenda as a draft. We see it when we get it. We would like to have the packet of materials come to us in time to really look at them closely, but often that doesn't happen. We know we have a great issue with minutes that are available to the public, and that is an enormous concern for every single person on the school committee. I think one of our key issues is facilitation. A good facilitator, I am a national um, school reform faculty facilitator, and I know what that looks like. I've worked with districts, I've worked with um, communities, I've worked with a lot of teachers, which can be like herding cats. Um, but that's where it starts. How do we use our time efficiently and how do we cover what we need to cover during the time we have to cover it? Thank you. Ms. Davis. Um, the meetings absolutely, ideally, would be shorter. Um, a huge issue is that there is a lot to talk about and everything is really important. Um, um, I had a whole vision when I got on the school committee almost two years ago that I'll, you know, like in my classroom, you know, move it right along. But there's a lot to talk about and um, we all want to express our concern uh, from, from the ward or from at large of um, what we think our constituents would want to hear. So um, I would advocate, as, if possible, to say we think this topic will be, should take about a half an hour and stick to it, that kind of thing. Um, and the minutes is a huge topic that I don't have time to <coughs> finish talking about, but absolutely that needs to be under control, gotten under control. Thank you. The next question is from Chad Kane of the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and it will be answered first by Ms. Davis. Okay, uh, bear with me on the first part of this question here. But um, surveys during and after the pandemic report large percentages of, of youth who feel so hopeless that they stop doing usual activities, have high rates of depressive symptoms and thoughts of suicide. What role can or should the school committee play in getting adolescent students the help they need? And uh, how do you think the school department is doing in this area? 
Um, just anecdotally, uh, during the pandemic, our youngest daughter was um, in high school. So I witnessed what it was like to be in a bedroom with a Chromebook and the screens all black. I felt desperately for the teacher as well, looking at names on the screen. So um, all around, it was a, not a great experience for anybody. At, at the role of what the school committee, that piece of it, because you said it was a few things. Yeah. Um, the role of the school committee, I think, again, because it's so, such a prescribed role, is to do anything we can to support what the superintendent can do for the her administ you know for her administrators um, to help the counselors in the school, the teachers to see. Thank you. You can always finish your sentence. Uh, to for the the counselors to to do what they can um, when they see struggling in their schools. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Robbins. This is an enormous concern, and we have a lot of children who have really floundered since the pandemic, but they were floundering before the pandemic as well. I, too, spent a lot of time um, at Zoom school, and it was challenging. Kids are resilient. A lot of them do make it past it, but the ones who don't are our responsibility because they can't do school successfully. And we try as hard as we can to budget for the support that they can get. That's one of our concerns in taking care of the whole child. But we also um, help with the superintendent creating the oversight of creating a harmony in school culture and climate that supports children who are struggling, that supports children and makes them feel like they are back as part of the community, that they're in a classroom that has the um, attention that they need as individuals, and that they're engaged in work that makes them think beyond the sadness that they have experienced over the last few years. Thank you. The next question is for members of the community, asked by Ingrid Flory, and it will be answered first by Ms. Robbins. All right. Northampton has adopted a full inclusion model of instruction for its special ed students. Are there any downsides to this? Full inclusion is, um, is almost a state mandated requirement and it is good for kids. It's good for all kids to be with kids. It's always a great idea. It's one of the hardest things that a district can attempt though because often children who are in a full inclusion class are overwhelmed by the number of children who are there. Who, they don't have the, um, the ability yet to be able to communicate in a way that makes them feel like they're part of it. I've watched, I sat in a third grade classroom last year where the teacher was teaching a book in the front of the room on the screen and there was a child who was um, an inclusive student who clearly recognized something on the screen that excited her. She saw it, it made sense, she wanted to talk about it, but her way of reacting was to be loud and to be um, a little disruptive to the other kids who were quietly listening to the story that was there and she had to be taken out. Those are the instances where it is, um, it's a real challenge for teachers, for the parents, and for the child to make that work, and it's different in every classroom. Thank you. Ms. Davis. Uh, yes. Um, full inclusion model. Um, I'd say the only downsides are, the way I see it, are um, when the classrooms are short staffed. So if a, if a student perhaps has, says in, her, in their IEP that they uh, have a paraprofessional working with them and that person gets pulled, which happens, um, then that child is left in the classroom, maybe not getting everything that they need. But um, well-trained professional teachers, which we have here in Northampton, know how to work with all kinds of students who are reading, who are not reading, who are capable of doing the work, and they can support them according to what the IEP dictates. Thanks. Thank you. And the next question is from Chad Kane at the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and it will be answered first by Ms. Davis. So I think one of you touched on this, but um, there's a, there's a bill in the legislature to require climate change instruction for all grades, or in all grades. 
Uh, if you support that bill, how would you help ensure that climate change is taught is is taught in all grades? And uh, if you don't support the bill, uh, please explain. Um, I definitely support this. I took a class myself last year on how to learn how to teach climate change in the classroom, and I teach very I teach second grade, so I'm like. How do we do that? Um, uh, but it's science. It's teaching science. And um, so that's new, that's professional development for teachers on what that means and what the real definition of climate change is. But um, it's part of the, the world for these, for these young people. It's just, I, I believe. And so um, uh, it definitely, should be taught, but it will take some lead time, I think, for, for, for teachers to be trained. Thank you, Ms. Robbins. Thank you. Um, this is my pet love in many ways, and it's, not, it's a big pet. It's a really big pet because it's the future for kids. And I think that it, this is getting support from this for the state legislature is um, one of the biggest shining lights that we've had. There are three bills that have come over the years to the legislature to approve on this and it gets shot down every single time. So having a, a new climate chief in our state is enormous and this will be enormous. It will take time to produce a state curriculum and I think in the interim, we as a district really need to think about implementing one right now that coordinates with our own sustainability plan and helps kids scaffolded from the early grades, like Eileen teaches, all the way to 12th grade. For example, when parents come to JFK to pick their kids up, their engines are all idling. So they, those are the things kids can do, and we start from there. Thank you. The next question is from members of the community, asked by Ingrid Flory, and it will be answered first by Ms. Robbins. How do you envision the future of our schools, particularly regarding declining enrollment and continual teacher and administrative staff turnover? The future of our schools depends on us, and declining enrollment um, is an ambiguous piece of it. We may have declining enrollment. We really don't know. Our number of our kids don't go to school in our district, so priority one might be why not. That was a good question. Um, declining enrollment might mean, though, that it gives us a chance to really think about economy of scales. The worst thing you can say to a parent in this city is we might need to close a school. We might need to actually create one whole new school that incorporates uh, different kinds of grade spans, but actually gets us federal and state funding, which is available to us right now. It's something we need to get in at the ground floor, uh, get our proposals in there, and get, uh, meet those grants and start talking about that. And we are one of the districts last in the state to be addressing that. And yeah, thank you. We're good. Thank you. Ms. Davis. Um. It's true about the declining enrollment, and I would say um, we need to invest in, the, in our teachers. They are professionals. I've been told um, many times, oh, how can you be a teacher? You're so um, uh, patient as if, if you're patient, you can be a teacher. Well, teachers are professionals that have you know, high levels of education, and we need to continue to invest in them and pay them, um, which of course intersects with the budget, but they need to be paid and as professionals should be. And to see the big picture of, like as a big view of our city and the schools and um, promote the arts and um, lead with excellence and a positive school culture and ongoing professional development with what the teachers say that they need. Thank you. We have time for two more questions. This next one is from the Daily Hampshire Gazette. It will be answered first by Ms. Davis. Uh, since you're both on the committee, I think this applies. So thinking about an important decision that um, that is coming up, or I don't have one in mind, but um, just any important decision that the committee faces, 
What's a specific example that you can do to engage both more people and a wider variety of community members, mm -hmm. you know, to, to be aware of that decision and, and just to be more involved? So for me, that, that gets into one of the things that I said was a goal uh, for myself if I'm on the committee again, which is um, more and pro more proactive, more effective outreach to the community. So this would be a test of follow through for that. Um, I certainly think that whatever's coming down the road with the budget is going to be something that we should be engaging the, uh, the whole community with. And you know, schools are an enormous part of the city budget. So um, uh, some people have talked about focus groups. Um, you know, not everybody can come to things like that. So I think that going to wards and setting up meetings where people are um, could be one, one starting place. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Ms. Robbins. We will be doing that. We have started. Um, I've spent two years asking our leadership on the school committee to have goals and to help us do strategic planning. Our new superintendent has started that process, and that process will incorporate how we work with community to define how we want our schools to be, what they should look like, how we fund them, and how we fund um, the teachers that we want to both attract and retain in our schools. And that, to me, is one of the most exciting things that we've done for many years. The last strategic plan we did was over 10 years ago, and not much came out of it. Nobody followed through on it. This one, if I'm on the school committee, we're going to do it, and we're going to make a plan, and we're going to have annual goals, and we're going to stick to it, and we're going to create a really, really amazing district. Thank you. And wait, we're into the next question now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the last question. Is from members of the community and it's asked by Ingrid Flory and it will be answered first by Ms. Robbins. All right, so we've had a couple, couple submissions on this topic. What should the policy be when a parent wants books banned from school libraries? What should the what be? The policy be. Ah. Uh, well, I am on po rules and policy, and I know that's going to come to us. Um, we should be anticipating it before it gets there and have something that is really in front of us. That is something that's happening in communities all around us. Northampton may be last on the list because we might be the hardest one to hit, but it will happen. And a policy is something that we create on rules and policy by looking at what other districts are doing and by looking at what the examples of the Massachusetts Association of School Committee supports us for. Um, and we don't have one yet. We have one that supports uh, curriculum. It supports teacher choice. That particular piece of it is something that I, I have actually said. It should be up on our, not our crisis list, but our next really um, important piece of uh, road, road work that we have and can refer to if anybody does come to us. Our time is getting shorter and shorter before that does approach us. Thank you. And Ms. Davis. Um, I feel ex very strongly about this, uh, that books should not be banned in our libraries in, in any shape or form, but I'm not the only person on the school committee, so like that's not really how it policy gets formed. And so um, to me, a policy with the appropriate committee would, that would be written would say something to the effect, if this is your question, I think you said, what would it say or what would we do, uh, is um, all books are uh, permitted at our schools provided that they provide X, Y, and Z to the benefit and enlargement of the worldview of our students or something like that so that they can see why, why we're allowing such book that they're concerned about. Thank you. We will now move to closing statements, and they will be given in reverse order from the opening statements. We will have 60 seconds, and so we'll begin with Ms. Davis. Okay, so thank you again for hosting this forum. My hope is that I've done a bit to introduce myself uh, to you and to earn your vote. 
Um, I want to serve as one of the at-large members of the Northampton School Committee because I'm eager to be part of supporting the superior teachers and staff at our schools. I'm proud of the hard work that they do each day for the children of Northampton. I know that one way to honor teachers and school staff includes recruiting and retaining a diverse workforce, which we hadn't mentioned a whole lot tonight, but I wanted to put that out there, and I hope to continue to work towards that goal. I also understand the school committee must focus serious and creative attention on the budget. And um, I want to add, since I didn't effectively answer the question before, that I uh, serve currently on the Capital Planning Committee and have learned a great deal about the budget and would add more about that. It would be an honor and a privilege to continue to focus on my school committee work and do what we can collaboratively to move our school district forward. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Robbins. And thank you for inviting us tonight. I have been a teacher for quite a long time and for the past two decades I've worked with schools and districts in creating collaborative professional learning communities. I am a national facilitator and CFG trainer for the National School Reform Faculty. I facilitate collaborative educator groups and I'm good at it. In these groups we often explore the difference between collaboration and collegiality. One defines how we problem solve and the other defines how we informally sit together in the same room. Some of us might bring grapes to share or remind us that our Zoom voice is on mute. There's a difference between collaboration and the need for open, democratic debate and discussion. We work together through debate and various perspectives. Suggesting that democracy and debate are somehow a problem misses the point. Diversity of opinion is how we create new ideas and solutions, because diversity is about ideas. And the school committee should lead the way in bringing teachers, parents, students, and the community together in developing ideas. This is how we grow as a community, and this is how we support a common vision of what that community is. Thank you. Thank you. Now you may. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the candidates. And um, because Ms. Agnes couldn't be here, I would like to note that the candidates were given the opportunity by Northampton Open Media to record statements. So you can find those recordings at their website. Uh, we're going to take a 15-minute break, and uh, we'll begin the City Council at Large Forum at 8 p.m. Hi, everybody. We will now continue with the Forum for City Council at Large. There are, there are four candidates for two open seats. Uh, we'll begin with uh, two-minute opening statements from the candidates. The order will be as follows. Uh, Garrick Perry, followed by Roy Martin, then David Allen Murphy, and Marissa Elkins. Two minutes, starting with Mr. Perry. All right. Well, first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, my name is Garrick Perry, and I am running for at-large counselor largely for the same reason I ran for Ward 4, uh, because I love the city, and I've learned to love it even more during my time as a city counselor. When I first was elected to council, we were dealing with a time of great change and upheaval during the COVID epidemic. As a city known for our arts, our culture, our cuisine, uh, Northampton was hit extremely hard. During my time on the council, I've worked with our local businesses to expand Summer and Strong. I work with our artistic community to book performances on Masonic Street Live. And I've worked collaboratively with the Chamber of Commerce and the DNA to create new events through the Vibrancy Project. But I really don't think my work is done here. We are entering a new time of change as we re redesign our main street. I feel my skill set, my experience, and my vision will be valuable to help guide us towards a new, vibrant downtown. For me, entertainment not only equals revenue through tourism and ways to bolster our businesses by bringing bodies, but it's also about building community. Our greatest resource is people, and over the last 20 plus years here, I've shown that I can help bridge gaps, work well with others, and foster community building. And speaking of community, I am running because I feel it's important to have diversity in our city's representation. Not only as a person of color, but as a renter, an artist, and a service industry worker, I feel my perspective is unique. I've done a lot of work during my time as counselor looking at barriers to service and working on ways to make our community more inclusive. The more voices we have, the stronger we are. I am proud to have worked with Councilor Elkins and Gore to put forth a resolution to study racialized harms for black residents and workers, and I'm even prouder to be a member of the committee to do this work. Um, I have to 
wrap this up. So I have chosen to make North Hampton my home and the place that I'm raising my children. And I truly want to continue working to build a city that everyone can't help but love. And that's why I'm here. Thank you. Mr. Martin. Uh, my name is Roy C. Martin. Uh, the reason I, I run for city council at large is I had run for mayor several times in this city. And uh, each time the people said to me, well, you don't have a college education. I don't think you can make it. But over the years, I've learned a whole lot about city council and city council at large, right? Uh, I think that I would make a good city councilor at large, right? Okay, so really quick, right? I was born in New Hampshire 80 years ago. My past birthday was September 28th. I always looked into helping others. Uh, Mary Ford brought me into the political stage of my life. It was her eyes on the street. As you know, by past endeavors, I always was looking to keep Northampton clean. Uh, we have had honor court as a part of the city. Many ask, why, uh, why not now? There is also many taxes and, and running, yeah, the high taxes are all running people out of their homes, right? The older people are getting run out of homes, right, because the taxes are so high. And you, know, you have people coming in, buying up the property and stuff like that. But that is not helping the older people. They're ending up, there's people that sell their house. They had to sell their house. Okay, I got 10 seconds, right? 30. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I got 30 seconds. Okay, oh, so I can... Well, not anymore. Let's <laughs> go. <laughs> uh, there is uh, there's high taxes, right? And this city, and people are wondering why they high taxes. So I see it, right? You know, I'm just going to stop there because people know me from the years past. They know I fought against high taxes. I fought to people... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Murphy. Thank you. Being a city councilor is not a soapbox for your personal political views. Being a city councilor is competently overseeing the operation of a $132 million municipality that provides vital services to city residents and taxpayers. Services like police, fire, and emergency medical care, water, sewer, streets, education, and parking. From the building department to the Board of Health, the City of Northampton touches almost everyone's life on a daily basis. You deserve a city council with experience who can bring the knowledge and expertise necessary to do the job right. Northampton is getting to be an expensive place to live. We just received a major increase in our water bills. The average property tax bill will likely increase by 8% in fiscal year 2024. In her budget, the mayor indicated she's likely to request a Proposition 2.5 general override sometime next year. A general override is a permanent increase to the tax levy that can then grow by 2.5% each year thereafter. This can be a major burden for those starting out or are seniors trying to live on a fixed income. In January, there could be only one member of the council serving that's been through an override. I've served as council finance chairman through both general and debt exclusion overrides. I have a good working knowledge of Proposition 2.5, the Northampton budget process, and Massachusetts municipal finance laws and regulations. I believe the city council should meet in person. In my experience, debate is more comprehensive. Issues before the council are dealt with more transparently with in-person meetings. Councilors just voted themselves a major raise starting next year. They should be expected to show up for in-person meetings. In our last municipal election, over 60% of those registered didn't choose to vote. I regularly hear people questioning the direction of the city. You do have a chance to make a difference. Invest the 15 minutes it takes on election day to cast your vote for the future of our city. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Elkins. Hi, I'm Marissa Elkins. I'm one of your two current city councilors at large. Thank you to the League of Women Voters um, for hosting tonight uh, and for everyone who was involved in this, with sponsoring this. I'm running for re-election because I'm proud of my record working for my neighbors and our community, and I don't feel like my work or our work is done yet. I'm looking forward to tonight to talk, talking about some of the important priorities for the city that I've been able to work on since I was sworn in in 2022. 
I'm proud of the fact that I led the fight in City Council to fund public health, in, health and safety and to fund the tools we need to make sure Northampton meets its obligations to hold police accountable and protect the due process rights of people involved with encounters with the Northampton Police by funding police cruiser dashboard cameras. I work very hard on to uh, continue to reform zoning to meet our current uh, our housing needs now and in the future. As city councilor, I've worked closely with the Northampton uh, Department of Planning and Sustainability to continue two decades of creative and responsible zoning reform to encourage development and desperately needed housing that is sustainable and attainable no matter your walk of life. At every opportunity, I've acted to make sure that Northampton meets and exceeds the goals we've set for ourselves as a city in the face of a very real climate crisis. And I've worked, uh, along with my uh, co-counsel, uh, uh, Councillor uh, Perry, and, and also current Councillor at Large, uh, Jamila Gore, toward a racially just and equitable Northampton by co-sponsoring with them the resolution to create the Joint Commission to Study Racialized Harms Perpetrated Against Black Residents and Workers in Northampton. And like my colleague, Councillor Perry, I am on that commission and very much looking forward to continuing that work. There is uh, much work to do. This is a city that tackles hard problems with big ideas and earnestly works uh, toward achieving those goals and living according to our values. And so that's a city I want to continue to work for. Thank you. So we'll continue the process uh, with alternate questions between uh, Chad Kane from the Daily Hampshire Gazette asking um, and Ingrid Flurry asking questions from the audience. Once again, if you have a question, uh, if you need a card to write your question down, raise your hand. And if you have a question that you're ready to turn in, raise your hand and a league member will gather those. So the first question uh, is from Chad Kane at the Daily Hampshire Gazette. The order it will be answered in is Mr. Martin, Mr. Murphy, Ms. Elkins, then Mr. Perry. All right, good evening. Um, the city will soon launch a search for a new police chief. Uh, what attributes are most important to you in the police department's next leader? Well, you know, I, when I read that, you know, I read it online, and I read that the police chief was looking towards going to the Cape, and I'm like, oh, no, we're going to lose Jody. All right, you know, she's done such a good job here. And a lot of people, and some people blame her that they didn't have body cameras and stuff like that. Right, that's not right, right? Because she tried hard for everything that she got for this city, and she did work for everything. Right. She worked hard for the city. The, our policemen who were under budgeted right, and trying hard to at least catch up. We were down seven officers last I knew. Right. Our fire department's down. Our, you know, don't get me going on that. You know, right? I'm not, okay. You know, I'll just stop it there because I'm getting heated up here. <laughs> Mr. Murphy. Um, I was heartbroken to see Jody's leaving. She was a, a world-class police chief, uh, but the die was cast a couple of years ago when the city council, the city council owns this one when they cut the budget by 10%. We're over 20% down on patrol officers. We've just lost a world-class chief. We're gonna have a really hard time somebody that want, finding somebody that wants to step into an environment where the city council does not support its police department. I 100% feel that way. Gonna be a hard time finding somebody to come in you got to reestablish a budget that works. You're going to have to fund the police officers and hope you can get them, given the environment. It's going to be really tough. Uh, there's, there's, there's no magic way to do this. It's a hostile environment there now, and we got our work cut out for us finding somebody that wants to step into that and try to fix it. Thank you. Ms. Elkins. Um, I do agree that uh, Chief Casper, Casper is going to be very hard to replace. Um, she is, uh, she's been an, uh, an outstanding uh, chief of police um, for this community and for the city. And the reason why is, is also because of the things that we need to be looking for in her replacement, which is to say that somebody who is responsive to this community's values and who uh, hears what we are calling for and asking for in terms of uh, uh, again, I keep coming back to the words of values, calls for reform, calls for um, pr 
progressive ideas about the way we meet the needs of the uh, city's public health and safety, and that uh, that we can um, protect um, the community while also being humane and respecting people's due process rights. So it's of paramount importance that we find somebody who is as committed to that as uh, Chief Casper was. Um, I'd also just note that um, uh, the, the problems with hiring in the police, uh, finish my thought, is a nationwide problem. It is not unique to Northampton. It is happening where they cut police budgets and where they did not. So uh, I would just uh, push back a little bit on the idea that this is a unique Northampton problem. Thank you. Mr. Perry. Yes. Um, so when I became a counselor, we were at a time of, of, again, great change. We were just coming out of the murder of George Floyd, and there was a call for reimagining the police. Um, during my time as a counselor, I have been on the interview committee for new officers, so I've had a first-hand experience of seeing what a great leader that Chief Casper has been. I also got a chance to see what uh, the community and, and the values that our uh, police department holds. I think whoever is next is going to, again, have big shoes to fill, but one thing they have to understand is the uniqueness of our city. Not only do we have our residents, but we also have an influx of students who come here, some from all around the country and the world. Um, you have to really understand how unique Northampton is in all of its, um, you know, in, in its diversity. Um, but I also think you have to be able to bring a community together. I think that you're also, the next chief is going to have to figure out a way to reimagine police and start working with our division of community care because we have shown that we want to see a different type of policing. Thank you. The next question is from members of the community asked by Ingrid Flory. And the order, it will be answered beginning with Mr. Murphy, then Ms. Elkins, Mr. Perry, then Mr. Martin. All right, please share with us, what are two things that you hope to accomplish if you are elected? Um, the thing I'm looking to most, and this is like a one minute question, right? Um, the thing I'm looking forward to most is the debate amongst the council. I bring years of experience municipally to the table. I can't do much of anything, it's in my closing statement, I can't do much of anything individually. There's eight other councilors. I've got to have a compelling, debate with the other counselors to get them to consider my point of view on things. You know, I'm a little different than them. I'm not political. You know, the rest of the council is pretty progressive. I'm not political at all. I just want to run a good, efficient, cost-effective city, and I want to add that to the debate. I think that's the biggest thing I can bring to the table is a different point of view, and that, that different point of view is only going to prevail if I can convince my fellow counselors that it has some merit. That's been the hardest thing not being on the council, is not being able to participate in debate, not being able to put other ideas on the table for them to consider. That's been very, very difficult. So I think the one thing that I want to bring is, is debate. Thank you. Ms. Elkins. Um, yes, the first uh, thing that I, I feel is urgent that the city continue to work on and that I want to continue to have a role on uh, role in is working on issues around the, the climate crisis. I think the biggest, one of the biggest long-term things facing the city is, um, and we talked about it in the previous forum, but is, uh, uh, is the long-term realities of demographic loss and the need to reorganize our schools and how we treat them and then to couple that with what, how we need to build the infrastructure that educates our kids. We have an aging, uh, we have aging schools. They're not, uh, they're not uh, currently up to par to what we need them to be to meet our sustainability um, goals. And um, it's not clear that they're meeting all of our needs. Um, so that's just one facet and a big facet of, of the many things that are, we're, we have to look at holistically um, to meet our Prom our promises and goals is climate crisis. This is not a two minute quest answer question. <laughs> um, and I would also, uh, I, uh, housing is my jam. We have a housing crisis. I wanna continue to um, work on issues to uh, creatively meet our needs now and in the future. And this is not enough time for this question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Perry. Yes, I'll try and speed through this. Um, I am excited about a lot of things in, if I have another term. Um, the first is really helping to reignite our downtown and our environment. Um, we've been quiet for a long time. Northampton has been without any brick and mortar venues for a long time with the loss of that. For me, entertainment, again, is revenue. 
Um, I think that after my years here, for 20 years I've worked in the service industry, I've worked in uh, the entertainment industry, and I think that we are going to need someone to help guide uh, the city along. Um, I've worked with a number of the people who are taking over some of these places, and I want to continue doing that work that I have done uh, because, again, I feel like I'm uniquely suited for it. Uh, also, I am very big about housing. Again, I'm a renter, um, and I've been a, in the workforce for a long time, and I would like to work towards making more workforce housing and uh, making this area a little more inviting to people who don't own homes but who want to be a part of our community. Thank you. <laughs> Same question. Mr. Martin. Well, right, uh, she talked, Marissa talked about schools. Now, I remember when this place was built, all right, I was running, matter of fact, I was running for mayor at the time. <laughs> I remember when the high school was rebuilt, totally rebuilt, all right? And all of this stuff, right? I think there's one school in town that has not been rebuilt or sold, all right? So as far as schools goes, no, all right? Now, all right, as far as becoming part of city council, if I'm part of city council, I'm going to work towards things like uh, David's God or things like that, right? I'm going to work with other counselors to find out exactly what they want to find. Okay, right? I'll let it go. <laughs> Thank I know. you. I know, I got 15 seconds left. <laughs> the next question is I'll from... i the 15 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> the next question, it's not, doesn't work that way. You don't get it back. <laughs> The next question is from the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and it will be answered first by Ms. Elkins, followed by Mr. Perry, followed by Mr. Martin, uh, and then lastly, Mr. Murphy. Well, you've probably been asked this a lot, but I, I'm curious what your position is on the Main Street redesign project, <laughs> and um, uh, explain why you either support it or, or against it, uh, and then it, it, if there's well, the second part of the question is, what ideas do you have that can help businesses during the construction of that pro project? Um, it's, uh, I, I appreciate that this question is coming from the Gazette. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, I have very uh, transparently, uh, you know, uh, voiced my support for the Main Street Redesign Project. Um, I think it's going to be a transformative um, ev evolution of the life of our city and of Main Street. Um, and I am, I'm just generally, genuinely very excited about what it's, it's going to be bringing. I know that there's, uh, there can't ever be 100% consensus about every um, element um, of a plan like that. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that we are moving into, uh, we're moving into an age where we need to be less dependent on cars. We need to, uh, we need to make it just as safe for everybody who's coming there, no matter how, um, how they're arriving. Um, to be there and to be safe, and there are many elements in the design um, that is involved with that ensure that. The other thing is, is that um, it's going to be beautiful. Um, it's going to be beautiful, it's going to be walkable, and it's going to center what we want our downtown to be. So I'm very excited about that. And again, two minutes is not enough. <laughs> it's actually one minute. One minute. One minute. That's why it's, that's sure, why it's really not enough. That's why it flies by. <laughs> yes. Mr. Perry. All right. Um, as I said before, um, you know, I'm really excited about the redesign for Main Street. I think it's an example of some of the most robust study and public input uh, for a city process that I've experienced. Um, there's been a lot of detail put into the design. And as Councilor Elkin said, unfortunately, not everyone can be pleased. Um, but I do support what has been happening, and I look forward to seeing uh, downtown, which my kids can grow up in and experience what I see is going to be a vibrant um, with that being said, I do have a lot of ideas of how to help the businesses. Again, I've grown up in, in the downtown, uh, working at Cookshop here and, and Union Station and stuff. Um, I think that, again, creating events and ways for people to come to our downtown is going to be what saves our downtown. Um, you know, foot traffic, while you may lose a parking space, foot traffic is going to help people go past more businesses. I really want to focus on building community, and I want not only to bring new people to our area, but I want to make sure that the current residents find reasons to rediscover our downtown again. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Martin. Uh, now, we're talking about the redesign, and when, I'm, when I think of the redesign, I think of, look at East Hampton. All that traffic in East Hampton that's going over Route 91, 
They all come down through here in the middle of winter because they shut off the road that goes over to Holyoke. So all that traffic comes down through here. You have to live on Conn Street in order to know what Conn Street looks like about four o'clock in the afternoon with that roundabout down there. Now they put that roundabout down there. When they put the roundabout down there, tractor trailers go around that, they're up in the middle of the roundabout. I mean, you know, there's so many factors that goes into this. How is people going to go up Route 9, all right? They're going to come up through, and they won't be able to go up Main Street. Uh, so anyways, that's my idea on the redesign. I'm not really in favor of it. I say let's try it, and then if it don't work out, we can always go back. But everyone's saying, no, let's just get it done. And I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Murphy. Well, the downtown businesses have been through two years of COVID, COVID hell basically, because there weren't people down there. Um, even if this is the most insightful design possible, they're gonna go through another two or three years of hell during construction. No, ma no matter what it's gonna look like when it's done, they got another two or three years that is gonna be very disruptive to them. Now, personally, my concern is, I preferred the plan that had two travel lanes in each direction, because with only one travel lane, it's gonna take longer to get through, People are going to decide to take alternative routes, so the city councilors who have wards around Main Street are going to be dealing with a lot of traffic coming in their wards that is going to be avoiding Main Street because it takes longer to get through. As to what can be done to help out those businesses, I would suggest to the sitting city councilors that those businesses are going to be at public comment tomorrow night at city council and the council meeting after that telling you what they want you to do for them. Uh, many of them are very concerned about this. They're not happy with what's going on. I think they're going to come and tell you. Thank you. The next question is from members of the community asked by Ingrid Flory. And the order it will be answered is Mr. Perry, Mr. Martin, Mr. Murphy, and Ms. Elkins. Hey, this is on the topic of affordable housing. How will you specifically ensure provision of housing in the city needed for minimum wage workers employed in the city and also for young families and teachers? Well, affordable oh, housing. Hold on. Wait. Mr. Perry goes oh. first. Oh. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, I think that housing is an issue for many communities, and Northampton is, is really feeling that as well. Um, you know, through zoning is one way to help us. Um, create more housing. Um, you know, I, I tell people that neighborhoods aren't just buildings, it's people. Again, as a renter, I know that, um, you know, in my, the place that I've lived, I've been able to, to give back to not only the property, but my community. Um, I think that really focusing on making this area attractive to uh, up and coming families is going to be a, a great resource for us to bring more people. Um, and again, it's not only going to have to be zoning, but we're going to have to look at other grants and funding resources to help make these things happen. Um, there you go. Thank you. Mr. Martin. Okay. All right. Now, when to talk about subsidized housing or any other kind of affordable housing, right? I live in subsidized housing. I live at the Selbo House. So that's why I know all about Conn Street going up and down. I live on the fifth floor. I look down the city traffic. Now, right, if people want affordable housing, people are not going to come here to buy a $150,000, $250,000 home. Look at them new apartments they built down behind the post office. Them, their apartments are 250000 and up for an apartment, all right? And, you know, how many people live in Northampton that can afford that, all right? Maybe a lawyer, all right? But, uh, you know, it's things like that that we have to curb a little bit. We have to curb the price of housing in one way or another or build housing that's going to be affordable for the people. Thank you. Mr. Murphy. Um, the city doesn't really have the resource. I mean, it's a wonderful thing to think about, but we have zoning. All right, we can do zoning. And we have the money that comes from CPA for affordable housing. But there aren't really any other resources the city has. Zoning is the most powerful thing that we have. Um, most of the housing that gets built, I mean, housing costs outrageous. You can't create a five, three in one ranch house on any lot for much under $450,000 nowadays, and that isn't affordable. You just can't build them. 
Um, the lumber yard, uh, Live 155, was built with substantial money from sources outside the city. Uh, it's just too expensive for the city to tack a little loan. You have to have private dollars coming in to build housing, so you have to create a situation where people want to invest in private housing uh, and do it with private dollars, because there's no way the city has the money to do it. The cost is astronomical. Zoning's our best tool, because basically it's free. Thank you. Ms. Elkins. Um, yes, so uh, first of all, the cap capital A affordable housing, which is, is, is a, a defined thing, and there, it is, uh, which is really about meeting the needs of, of, of folks who are um, at a, a certain uh, percentage below the, the average income level. The fact is, is that actually Northampton does as good a job as any city does in, in creating of much, as much of that as we can, and as uh, Mr. Murphy said, um, that it requires partners, public and private partnerships, and requires a lot of sub subsidizing uh, because you can't build um, affordable housing for, it, it costs more to build than what you can possibly um, do for that. And so in that regard, actually, I, I think Northampton is doing a, a lot of good where we, um, what we can't control and what the city can't go out and just buy and build things are, um, is what's controlled by the market. And so to that end, I, we would be, I work very hard and I think it's uh, very important that we do things to um, encourage development uh, and specifically encourage sustainable development on existing infrastructure and also rent measures um, that um, to help renters um, such as the home rule petition to, um, uh, to shift um, the agent fees. Um, Thank you. The next question is from the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and it will be answered first by Mr. Martin, followed by Mr. Murphy, then Ms. Elkins, and Mr. Perry. Just following up with, a, with a, another housing question, um, a little more targeted, I guess. Do you, uh, how do you feel about the real estate transfer tax um, option that's being discussed now to provide additional funds uh, uh, for affordable I housing? I really am not up on on the real estate transfer tax. But uh, I can go back to one other thing, right? The city years ago always had that 10% of the housing in Northampton that was built had to be built with a stipulation for affordable housing in there. And I don't know, I've never heard, I haven't heard it for years, I haven't heard it said. So, uh, you know, and Mary Ford's the one that told me that, she says, Oh, I know. It come up with um, oh another housing project we have here in town that my, that Claire Higgins helped to pay off. She got a loan for them, so they could pay it off. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Murphy. Well, the assessors will tell the council tomorrow night that the average single-family house in Northampton is now assessed at four hundred and seventy-seven thousand dollars. That's the average house. Now it's counterproductive to add a tax on the transfer of housing, making buying housing more expensive to say you're gonna use it for affordable housing. So you're gonna make housing more expensive to buy to help fund affordable housing? That's ridiculous. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, things are not that affordable now between inflation, between high interest rates, between the fact that the average property tax bill is going up 8% this year, and then you throw on another tax in the name of affordable housing, that's insane. It, it just does, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So uh, I, I wouldn't be in favor of that at all. Got to find another way to fund affordable housing than making housing more expensive to do it. Thank you, Ms. Elkins. You know what? I'm going to be really frank here. We're, we're so far in the weeds with this question that I don't. I don't. I'm not going to pretend that I'm pre prepared to answer it. And I'll be happy to, you know, supplement that answer. Um, but that's a that's a, uh, you know, and I'm, we're going to be hearing more about it. But I, I'm not going to. Okay, Mr. Perry. Yes. Um, <clears throat> So I will also say that I am not fully prepared to answer this question, but uh, one of the things that I do love about being a counselor is uh, learning and education. Um, this is a, a great opportunity for me to learn more about it, but I do know that uh, housing is very expensive right now. 
Um, but I think that we have to use every tool in our toolbox. Um, and so I will do some research and, and see whether or not this makes sense for our city and our community. Um, but I do know that we have to figure out ways to get affordable housing. Um, so there I am. Thank you. The next question is from members of the community asked by Ingrid Flory. The order, it will be answered. Mr. Murphy, Ms. Elkins, Mr. Perry, and Mr. Martin Lest. Okay. How will you listen to and respond to constituent concerns? How will constituents be able to reach you? How will you make yourselves available to them? Mr. Murphy. Oh, thank you. Um, I've got 14 years of council experience responding to people's needs. Be it phone calls, I call back. Be it emails, I email back. In fact, I, I really love emails because you've got a track record of the back and forth and what people asked and what you said. Uh, the biggest thing is being available, being at meeting in public and talking to people uh, after, after the meeting or responding to their calls, responding to their emails. The most important thing we do as counselors is communicate with people. Now, I would suspect as an at-large counselor, I'd be communicating over different things. As a ward counselor, often it's neighborhood things. You know, my street lights out, or there's a loose manhole cover, or you name it, all kinds of things. I'd be interested to see it as an at-large counselor, the kind of things you hear about. I'd like to, I think they'd be more big picture items than the neighborhood things because they have ward counselors for that. But not, you gotta get back to people and I don't know of anyone from when I was a ward counselor that can say I never got back to them. Thank you. Ms. Elkins. Um, yes, it has been my experience that the, the, uh, the folks that people uh, come to me with as a uh, city councilor at large are a little bit different than what I hear from my colleagues on council, I mean, uh, that are on uh, with, the, with the wards. Um, and, uh, and I always say that I'm uh, part of what attracts me to this job and why I think I'm a good fit for the job is I'm a, I'm a big picture thinker. I really do like thinking holistically and about the policy. Um, and that is the things that folks uh, come uh, and, and want to talk with me about. And so, um, you know, so it's the usual things. It is email, it is phone calls. Um, I do my best to try and get back to folks when they reach out to me and, and certainly let them know. Um, I also, um, this is dismissed and maybe it doesn't feel Maybe it feels a way to folks who come and participate in it, but open uh, public comment is a huge part of how we hear from the city. And it is also, by its very nature, something we don't necessarily, we're not always able to talk back in the moment. Um, but we, we do always hear and we always, um, it's part of the dialogue, um, the larger dialogue. So those are all the ways I try to keep in touch and hear and listen. Thank you. Mr. Perry. Yes. So. Uh, much like school committee member Davis said, uh, I, I want to challenge myself. Um, again, being a counselor has taught me a lot of things and I've learned a lot. Um, one thing that I, I really want to work on more is communicating with my neighbors and my constituents. Um, while uh, Mr. Murphy really enjoys emails and phone calls, I am more of an in-person person. Um, I really enjoy meeting my neighbors face to face and one thing I really want to do if I am a, a counselor at large is set up times and places to meet with people, um, to have office hours of sorts and, and figure out ways to actually engage with people outside of emails and, and phones, especially coming out of a post-COVID time. Um, but I will say again, that's something that I really want to work on is getting out there and communicating more with my constituents. Um, because. Sometimes you get busy and it's hard to do that, but I want to be better and I want to, to meet you all. Thank you. Mr. Martin. Uh, by being city council at large, when I went out and I got my signatures, I got 200 signatures. I went in every single ward. I used to go walk up five houses, down five houses, using my cane, and I would get my signatures. And I would talk to people. I would give them a card and I'd say, you have a problem, you call me and it's got all three of my phone numbers on it. I've heard from a few of them people, and a lot of them told me what they would like to see or what they would like from city council. You know, the problems they were having, the things that was going on, things that were going on in their ward, things that were going on downtown, right? I heard about the redistricting, I heard about a lot of different things. And uh, yeah, here we go, 15 minutes, yeah, 15 seconds. <laughs> okay, uh, so to, to bring it all to one big head, yes, 
You got to listen to people. And you can't only listen to people by telephone because a lot of times they don't call. Thank you. <laughs> so we have time for two more questions. The next question is from the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and it will be answered first by Ms. Elkins, followed by Mr. Perry, then Mr. Martin, and then Mr. Murphy. Okay. Um, a new Climate Action and Project Administration Department has been established um, by the city, or to help the city achieve carbon neutrality for all city operations by 2030, with net zero carbon emissions by 2050. If you were advising that department, um, my question said, what are two top ideas? But let's just go with one top idea <laughs> <laughs> to give you time to answer it. One top idea that you would want them to look at implementing to help achieve these goals. Am I first? I think so. Oh, okay. sorry. Yes, Ms. Elkins. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I think COP is um, already doing, and it has a focus on, on what, I would, what I agree they should be focusing on, which um, to start with is the looking very, very um, closely at city buildings and infrastructure um, for, um, to making sure that sustainability and our resilience goals are centered at every level of design, um, uh, the, the policy behind them, the design, um, and then the procurement and at every level. Um, I have been, I was with uh, uh, Eileen, uh, Eileen on the Capital uh, uh, Projects um, Advisory Committee um, now for a few years, and um, we have brought into that, um, that advisory role this constant request to every department head for everything they come and ask um, to spend money on to, for them to be thinking about resiliency and sustainability. COPPA is that uh, institutionalized. It's, it, is, it is baking it into the cake of how our city runs and, and how we uh, meet our priorities and our goals. Thank you. Mr. Perry. Yes, um, I would agree that I think, um, you know, really looking at our municipal buildings is important um, for our climate action. But I also think that, and the city is doing this, but looking at our vehicles and our fleet, also making those more efficient is going to be very important for the future. Um, but I, I will let you know that I am not an expert on climate change, but what we do have, again, is people. People are our greatest resource. And I've been really impressed with people like Adele Franks and, and uh, whatnot who have stepped up. So if I were in charge, I would really continue to rely on the community members who are experts uh, as well to help guide us forward. Thank you. Mr. Martin. Uh, well, the only thing I can say about climate control is you saw the snow today, all right? And <laughs> it, it's another thing that I, it often wonders me because, you know, people talk about climate control. They talk about how hot it gets, how cold it gets, how much snow you get. Uh, you know, all of these things are in climate control. Now, we're not keeping a good track of climate control because in Maine, they're way ahead of us here. And over in uh, New Jersey, right, you know, they have a different climate over there. And now they're starting on electric cars that they're going to, the plant is shut down, right? I saw it on my online. The plant is shut down on the electric cars because they can't sell enough electric cars. So, uh, you know, which way are we going to go? Are we going into electric? Are we going into other ways? All right? Are we going to have headlights? Thank you. Mr. Murphy. Well, I think my recommendation would be to concentrate initially on picking off the, the low-hanging fruit, uh, the things that are cost-effective to solve. You know, if the cost to solve the problem is equal to or, you know, or less than what we're, we're spending now, it's a good thing. You know, do those things first. It's really expensive. Smith is doing geothermal on their campus. The cost to do that is $90 million more than our whole city budget this year, okay? It's crazy expensive to do this stuff. So do the cost-effective things up front and get the most bang you can for your buck. We're looking at an override next year to do what we're already doing now, okay? Just, just level services. I don't know where the money is going to come from to do the more expensive things, so by all means, pick off the things you can pick off that are cost effective that we can afford to do, and do every one of those you can do, because we're have to, going to have to grant fund the other stuff, because 
I don't know where the money is going to come from to do that, that really pricey, high-tech stuff like Smith is doing. It's really expensive. Thank you. Our last question is from members of the community asked by Ingrid Flory. It will be answered first by Mr. Perry, then Mr. Martin, then Mr. Murphy, and then Ms. Elkins. So we, we have a couple questions on the topic of budget. So, um, so could you please speak to your priorities within the city budget and how any efforts you might take to get the spending under control? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Perry. Well, obviously, we, as, as Mr. Murphy said, we are possibly facing an override. Um, you know, I would have to look at our funding our schools. We cannot continue to dip into our reserves because that is untenable. Um, you know, for me, my, my budget priorities, again, are, are the services that we utilize, whether it's fire and, and police, uh, but also hope, helping to maintain uh, and improve our, our systems uh, and roadways. So I would really start to look again at looking and working with our representatives and our senators to try and find some funding resources uh, for those things. Um, but also when it comes to budget, I believe that uh, right now the city is leaving a lot of money on the table. We are a city that is only operating for half the time. Our city becomes dark at night. Uh, we are losing a lot of revenue potential there. So I believe that really finding ways to increase revenue so that we can maybe possibly avoid an override are going to be very important for our future in Northampton. Thank you. Mr. Martin. That is a very... Well, <clears throat> I know we're, ta we're facing an override. I knew that six months ago uh, when I was talking with Gina Louise, and she said to me, I said, you know, I said, we can't have another override. She says, it's coming. All right, by next year, we'll have to have an override in order to run the city. And I'm like, why can't this city come budget compliant where they don't have to have an override and a lot of people and I told people when I was out on the campaign trail everybody I talked to everybody I gave a card to I told them I said you're looking at an override next year a lot of them people up there in the other wards they had houses that they owned their houses and they owned their property I had a couple that owned the property up there and they said we can't afford another override All right we'll have to leave. So, you know, right, it, it's up to, and it's up to all you people out there, right? You know, how many people really want an override, right? Do you think the city can run without an override? Thank you. I stopped. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Murphy. Mayor's budget message this year. Another Proposition 2.5 general override will be needed in FY25. We're in 24. FY25 starts next July to be implemented in FY26. That's in the budget message. Ain't no doubt about it. Okay? It's, it's going to be on the ballot. And, and really, what are we doing now? We started a new Department of Community Care. We turned the health department into a health and human services department. We're expanding what the city does into areas that aren't traditional city services. We had to give $2.3 million to the school department because they were over budget from our reserves. Uh, you know, I, it's hard to get the school committee or the city council to not want to do services for people. You know, the only way the city is going to control its spending is if the voters say, no, we're not going to give you any more money. Uh, we need to get the other level of governments, like the state government, that doesn't have budget constraints of Proposition 2.5 to start picking up some of these services that are not traditional municipal services. I want to see them happen. Cities just can't pay for them. The state or federal government has to. Thank you. Ms. Elkins. So yes, override uh, is coming. And that is uh, not uh, because of profligate uh, overspending. It is, in fact, um, the override is has been and has been now for a very long time a part of uh, Northampton's long-term fiscal responsibility um, plan that has held us in very, very good stead for uh, as long as it has been in place. It is also something that the overrides have been voted for overwhelmingly every time they've been put to the voters. Um, and I think that is because we, this city's government demonstrates at every turn that they stick to the plan, that they have a long-term plan, and that they, they spend the tax money, taxpayer money's, taxpayers' money widely. And that 
long-term plan held us in good stead during COVID. It allowed us to maintain our top bond rating um, that has been uh, needed to uh, be able to borrow what we need um, to carry out city functions and to build and to build our infrastructure um, at the lowest race rate possible. Um, also, we, I, I resist the idea that we have a, uh, that we have a spending problem um, because the fact of the matter is, is, as Mr. Murphy said, we don't get enough for what we need from the states. We don't get it from the federal government and we don't get it. We can't only generate so much from tax revenue. So we do so much Thank with you. what we have. Thank you. We will finish with closing statements. Uh, each candidate will have 60 seconds. Uh, the order they will go in is Mr. Barton, Mr. Murphy, Ms. Elkins, and Mr. Perry. So we'll begin with Mr. Martin. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you've seen me again. All right, many of you have seen me before, and now you're looking at me again. And this time I'm running for city council at large. All right, I'm hoping to get uh, a third of the votes out of this audience. And... Uh, you know, the people that I talk to out there and the people that I talk to about the override before it was even brought up to the public, uh, now they know, right? They know the truth. And also, if you people look at the budget yourselves, you'll see there is waste in the budget. I won't say where, but I know there's waste in the budget. So with that, see you later. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Murphy. Before I begin my closing statement, I'd like to point out that the last override was implemented in FY22. Three years later, we need another one. We used to get seven years out of them. That isn't taking into consideration all the ARPA money that got dumped on the city. Or a pandemic. If I rejoin the council in January, it will be one of nine councilors. The only way I'll have to impact any council policy will be if I can convince my fellow councilors that my... Um, that my position on a matter uh, being debated has merit, okay? What I miss most about being on the council is being able to participate in debating the important issues that affect the future of the city. I've spent the last 40 years as a volunteer, committee member, assessor, and counselor. I've worked with and learned from hundreds of others in that time to amass no a knowledge base about how our city functions. I've seen what works. I've seen what hasn't worked. I've learned to respect others' opinions and formulate my own opin opinions with their advice. I feel I can bring the value of that knowledge base to good use by returning to the City Council. I thank you for the opportunity to, to participate in this evening's forum. Thank you. Ms. Elkins. Thank you. Twenty years ago, my wife and I chose to make this amazing city our home, and it's a place we knew because we knew it was a place we could live alongside people who shared our values. And whether you're a person who were, was born here or if you're like my family and came here, we all chose choose to make this place our home. What I love about Northampton is that we're a city where people collectively make the choices we need to live out those values even when it's hard. We ask hard questions of our leader, leaders and demand more of ourselves as a community. I simply ask that um, if you haven't voted already by the time uh, you go to the, the polls on November 7th, um, that I've been so honored um, that my neighbors have chosen me to do the service once, and I ask again for one of your two votes for city councilor at large, um, because as I said before, a city that does hard things is a city that I want to serve. Thank you. Mr. Perry. All right. Uh, again, thank you guys for the opportunity to be here. Um, I just want everyone to know I, I really am excited about the future of Northampton, um, and I do believe that my vision and skills will help usher in this sort of renaissance of the city. Um, but I know that if we don't learn from our past, we, and without proper guidance, we could miss a great opportunity to build a stronger, more inviting city. I believe that working with our neighboring communities and thinking regionally will strengthen the draw to this beautiful area. I've told people that instead of thinking of Amherst versus Northampton or Holyoke versus East Hampton, let's think bigger. For the last few years, I've been working in Holyoke and Springfield and talking to their city leaders, and I think that uh, as a councilor at large, I'll have more of a voice to continue this work. Um, let's work on ways to bring folks to our area and enjoy our differences and highlight those. But also, again, this job is about learning, and I'm eager to continue my journey of education. I've learned not only from the mayor's office, but also from my fellow counselors, my neighbors, and my constituents. Um, I know I may not have the answer to all of our problems in Northampton, but I do know that working together, uh, we can come closer to finding some solutions, and I'm fully committed to helping and finding my part to play in a brighter future for Northampton. Thank you. Now you may applause. <laughs> Thank you. 
Before you head home, just a reminder that Election Day is next Tuesday, November 7th, with the polls open from 7 to 8 p.m. The last day to register to vote was October 27th, but if you have had transactions with the Registry of Motor Vehicles, you are automatically registered. You can check your registration status and find your polling place in the city clerk <laughs> section of the city of Northampton's website. Early voting for all Northampton <laughs> voters. <laughs> early voting for all Northampton voters continues at City Hall through November 3rd from 8:30 a.m. to 4:30 p.m. If you obtained a mail-in ballot before the October 31st deadline, you can return it to the drop box in front of City Hall 8:45 a.m to 4.15 p.m. daily or mail it, but remember it must be received by 8 p.m. on November 7th. Please join me in thanking our co-sponsor, the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and our technical collaborator, Northampton Open Media. You'll find their tape of tonight's event on YouTube by this Friday, November 3rd. Particular thanks goes to our candidates, Chad Kane and Ingrid Flory, and most of all to the candidates, and you, the community, we at the League of Women Voters believe that your participation in events like this makes democracy possible. Good night. <laughs>